and we're live. Hello and welcome everyone uh, to the third edition of Anandke's Women in Literature. I am absolutely thrilled uh, to introduce this amazing panel titled Inclusive Publishing. Um, so over to you, Nida. Thank you so much, Sabine. I'm, I'm so honored that you chose me to chair this panel. Uh, because you know that inclusion and publishing are two of the areas that are uh, very close to my heart. Uh, I'll be uh, supported in this, um, you know, uh, this panel uh, by Nuzit Nisar. So I'm going to hand over the welcome and introduction of speakers to her, where after we formally start the session. So Nuzit, over to you. Uh, hello, all. Welcome to uh, Anandke's uh, Inclusive Publishing Panel. And uh, I'm excited for this uh, panel because uh, it is very close to my heart uh, and it's about publishing and we have uh, uh, we have trailblazers of publishing in this panel. We have Arpita Das, we have Christina Priya Danuja, we have Behan Sen, we have Namrata from Kitab and, uh, and a lot of our fellows which will be joining us in this conversation. And uh, So let me introduce you to our first panelist, uh, Ms. Arpita Das. She's uh, the founder of your writing just from India. And uh, then here is uh, Ms. Namrata, which is the editor of Kitab. Nuzat, I think your internet is a bit a bit wonky. Then, then we have uh, yes. Uh, Don't worry about it. Just wanted to say that. No worries. My children are also sucking off the internet, so take your time. It's okay. Uh, I think uh, Vinada, if you can introduce uh, sure, sure. Mahesh, it will be. I'm trying. To check. Sure. Uh, so we have four extremely talented publishers, authors, uh, you know, people wearing multiple hats with us. We have Arpita Das, the publisher and founder at Yoda Fresh, a, 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 a writing mentor, senior writing instructor, and also part of Stroke University's visiting faculty. Uh, Arpita, welcome, and we're so glad that you're joining us and you'll be able to, you know, answer some of our very pressing questions that we have on the topic. We also have with us uh, Ms. Christina Dhanraj. She's also a writer uh, with more than a decade of corporate work experience in India, which is very exciting because, uh, you know, I, I want to explore how, you know, writing has to be supplemented with, you know, some sort of another additional experience and how writing can find its own feet in terms of a career path. So, Thank you so much for joining us. She's the co-founder of Dalit History Month Project as well, and has published on intersectional discourses between caste, gender, religion, race, and sexuality. So that's where we're going to be talking about inclusion as well. Meher Hussain is a British Pakistani journalist and author of Pakistan Fashionable History. Uh, she's worked in different roles in the media industry as an uh, assistant editor at Good, Good Times Magazine and as a columnist. And she has uh, you know, her own enterprise that was set up uh, in 2020 by the name of Zuka Books. Uh, she's been a fighter um, and she's been uh, someone who's been fighting for the writing industry in Pakistan against the books ban. So we're very excited that she's joining us today. And finally, we have Namrata, who's the editor of Kitab, a South Asian literally magazine based in Singapore. Since 2018, she also runs a creative agency called Kimia Creatives, where she works with authors and publishing houses in different capacities. Uh, she's, she's a published author who enjoys writing stories and think pieces on travel, relationships, and gender. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I'll just give a brief introduction. Um, I have done my law, and I am a gender and equality practitioner, but writing is, is, a, is an interest that I've uh, taken to on the side, probably like Christina. 
and have uh, also I'm also a member of Authors Alliance in Pakistan and have written a short story that was published in the stained glass window. Uh, it's an anthology during the pandemic that was released and so it's on stories that were based on uh, pandemics. So that's basically what I do. Uh, I'll be chairing this panel with, with all of you. And I will open now the, the questions to all our panelists. I, will, I want to start with uh, sharing a very interesting study that I came across. Uh, the study is done by University of Minnesota and it's on women writers. And it says that they are publishing more books than men. Uh, in the 1970s, there were obviously fewer, very few women who were publishing books. But by 2020, more than half of the books that were published in the US were by women. Uh, and their books were outselling the books published by men uh, as well. So, and, and of course, this trend isn't confined to US alone. Uh, the study also highlighted that women make up 60% of authors in the UK and 62% of authors in Canada. But my question to you all is, uh, do you think that this is a trend uh, in Western societies only? Do, do, we, do we have similar uh, sort of a trend line in Asia and the MENA region? Uh, or is publishing more inaccessible for women from developing countries when you compare it with the free Western female counterparts? And if so, uh, what do you think are the factors behind that? So I think I'll start with Arpita. Hi, Nida, thank you so much. Lovely to be here again. Um, and uh, also to kick off my uh, time here at Ananke WLF. Uh, 3.0 with this particular panel, because this is a topic very, very close to my heart. Um, I think the, the part of the problem, of course, with uh, South Asia, I mean, I can't speak for the MENA region, but for South Asia, certainly, uh, is that we are woefully short in terms of statistics, you know, where these sort of surveys and reports are so hard to come by um, about the industry um, that it's very, very difficult to know for sure when essentially most of the time we are left making educated guesses. And uh, if I were to, you know, sort of do a bit of, uh, indulge in a bit of pop autoethnography and do that, uh, you know, essentially drawing on my uh, almost sort of 25 years in the industry, then I would say that uh, there has definitely been a huge jump in the, uh, in authorship in terms of, uh, you know, um, non, and, and when I talk about inclusive, I don't just think of women, I think of non cis het privileged men in our society. Uh, so, uh, you know, there has been a jump for sure. There is much, much more representation of non cis het privileged men in the author pools across the board with both um, uh, uh, large and small publishing houses. But there was an interesting, uh, your questions actually made me do a little bit of research the other day. And I found this interesting and worrying statistic for academic publishing. I mean, of course, this is very niche, but it gives us some idea uh, because we know that, you know, um, uh, in terms of uh, literacy, the, the literacy and research participation, um, the percentage of uh, non cis het privileged male representation has also grown in a big way in the last uh, 20, 30 years. But even now with journal publications, they are saying that, um, you know, men are publishing the first publication of a man, uh, uh, the first publication of an author uh, is likely to be that of a man. Um, and, and it is likely to be more than that of women by three times, um, which was quite uh, upsetting for me because I also teach uh, in university and I do a lot of mentorship 
and I conduct workshops with many, many early career researchers who are women and others. Um, uh, so I think there's still a huge amount of ground to cover. I'm sorry, that's a long answer to uh, your question, but it is a complex question. So I hope you'll forgive me. No, for thank you so much, Namrita. I'll take the same question to you. What's your experience been like? Uh, my experience is similar to what uh, Arpita said. I have also uh, not found any statistics, any results. And as you talk about factors, among the other factors, I would also like to highlight that women writers uh, especially face a lot of social challenges as well. Like, you know, recently I had done a series of interviews with South Asian women writers. And one of the most common thread that I observed was that family was against them writing strong female characters or women who use cuss words or, you know, erotica for that matter, or even romance. So, you know, it was like uh, the interview, I was, I just wanted to focus on the challenges of publishing, thinking that they will talk about, you know, how we could make it more better but these this was this was an aspect that was very surprising which came out i spoke to like close to 60 women across this and this was a very interesting thing that apart from other factors which we have a social factor is also a very important thing which women writers have to think of thank you so much christina from the writer's perspective i mean what would your understanding of this question would be do you think publishing is more inaccessible for women uh, from this part of the world? Yeah, I mean, um, I fully really agree with what Arpita said and uh, very interesting to hear what you mentioned, Namrata, about how, you know, um, internal dynamics can play such a huge role in what determines women are publishing or writing about. Um, from a writer's perspective, I think I want to mention a couple of things. Um, one is that I, I grew up I belong to this generation of women who, millennial, but I also grew up, you know, witnessing the, the boom of feminist publishing in India. And I grew up reading a lot of um, fictional Indian writing, the likes of Sitra Banerjee Divakarani and Jhumpa Lahiri. And eventually we had a lot of um, women who would write popular fiction the likes of Kate and Bhagat, and I, and I hated it both as a reader and I told myself, I'm never going to be writing that kind of stuff. But, but that said, I think eventually what happens when you discover, um, you know, opportunities or you're wanting to be included in these opportunities is that representation in and by itself, and I'm sure all of us will agree, is not the end, right? It's not the solution because representation is not just about who you're publishing, but also what content you're expecting out of these uh, uh, authors and, and publishers, right? Like, for example, when it comes to Dalit women and Dalit queer people in particular, the kind, and, and, and I'm going to go, and, go ahead and assume we all know what Dalit is. It's the oppressed a group in India by caste and Dalit is an identity we've taken on and uh, the kind of content that is expected of us is almost always autobiographical, a memoir, uh, shedding of one's personal blood, talking of soft stories so that it is always represented in a story format rather than uh, from an analytical political standpoint. Although there's a lot of political, analytical literature that exists in non-English format, right? So we have a lot of regional publication already. But when it comes to English publishing within India, I think the content in the name of representation is also expected to be only a certain format. And that to me is, is not okay. And that to me is something that we need to work against because we want diversity in not just authorship but also in the content that these authors are putting forth. I think that's wonderful and I resonate with it because in Pakistan we had the same issue with terrorism and all stories originating out of Pakistani authors that we wanted to get published uh, in foreign uh, publications 
they would want to add in some sort of an element of terrorism in it post 9/11 mm. and so, so we've had to face that as well and meher i mean you had an emphatic yes to what christina was saying so i want to hear your thoughts on this no absolutely dekho for me um the, the political is personal as much as i try and i have said this many times before i wish i could separate the two but i just can't i can't um i entered publishing because i was stunned at the lack of opportunities for pakistani authors i wasn't even aware as arpita very correctly said that in pakistan we don't have, we have no data at least in india we were to do a comparison you still have some data here we have nothing there is nothing but i was stunned by the lack of female presence in publishing um across the board in terms of editing player graphic design marketing selling none none of it it was all men and that was i mean i knew what to expect ki sare mart honge they'll all be men but i wasn't i didn't realize how bad it was till i actually got into it but you see once i delved into it i i also discovered that there is a layer of representation that goes beyond just presence i mean yes we've got female authors we've got you know um kamla shamsi babsi sidwa moni mohsen kurzalen heder uh, and many more but what does that representation mean for us today for female authors today has that opened up creative space in pakistan not at all has that enabled more female writers more female authors to come forth and tell their stories no it hasn't unless you come from a background of great privilege right and and a lot of that has to do with the safety and the security because as a, as an editor as a member of the media for the past well now it's 17 years what i've seen is that there are more females coming in they are writing they want to write they want to tell the stories but there's a severe lack of acceptability as namrata very correctly said families don't support but families don't even support our existence so that's that's a given right on the other hand families don't even want women expressing their thoughts because there's such a fear of what are they going to say you could even i as a political journalist the amount of oppression i have faced you like you why are you even writing this why am i not supposed to write this is my question to them right and then in terms of creativity the topics were expected to write i mean one of the things that i will never forget is going to a local publisher when the books ban hit and i said you know salam this is what i have to offer this this is and the guy said aap ladies hain aap romance kitabein likha kare <laughs> are you kidding me i mean i'd love to write a nice romantic novel but you know but but it was like that's it that's what we were expected to do and it gets worse because then you are not allowed to do any cultural commentary you are not enabled to do any political analysis you are not allowed to do anything that disrupts the social status quo so when zuka books was set up i was very clear that i'm not going to go down the commercial route but i most certainly i'm going to do work that creates a cultural disruption and i mean compared to everyone here i'm i'm pretty much a newbie i'm just a speck of dust but the work that we have done has had an impact and it it's it's created a cultural disruption and i think that is where the fight really lies in pakistan right now it's no longer just about females it really is about putting out work that that actually holds a mirror up to society and says this is what we are capable of and this is what you look like you look you look really foolish when you tell us you can't do this um yes uh, i think you are right about it and uh, this is the situation we have been facing in south asia uh, in every part of uh, the country but uh, somehow if uh, women writers came forward to uh, tell their stories then there come the gatekeeping as a publisher or as a editor how do you see it and uh, it obviously it is evolving uh, it it must be uh, a different meaning for me and it must be a different meaning to you uh, so uh, you uh, obviously as you have said as meher said about uh, that if you are privileged you can publish a book but but then again who will take the responsibility who will take the risk and find ways uh, 
to open open doors for women writers here how do you see gatekeeping in publishing as a publisher is, as an editor or as a writer um, this is i think it comes down as a collective responsibility especially in the case of pakistan i mean all my authors have taken great risks great risks and and it's interesting because what's what's surprising to me is that there, there's not been one non-fiction poetry uh book about a woman's lived experience in Pakistan. We were the first ones to do it. A graphic novel about a marriage breaking down. Pakistan mein shadi hi hai. Shadi hai ya khana hai. You either eat or you get married, right? That, that's pretty much it, right? And, and that, I think I'm going to take the liberty of speaking here. It is very much a so, so South Asian phenomenon. But in the case of Pakistan, where we have such a conservative society, one has to be careful. One has to take steps and one has to create an environment in which you are engaging with society on a level that they can understand. So that requires a lot of partnerships. That does not require, and this is something I've said again and again and again, we all have to work together. I don't hold any ideals at all. I think if we do work more than anything else, we need to create space for tolerance. I may publish something that you may not like, and you may have an opinion about a book that I may not like, and that's okay. Maybe we we breathe the same air, we can carry on. But we don't have that tolerance, so then how do you expect any creativity to happen? So that's where we need to sort of gel together. Yes, partnership is is a solution for uh, for um for a lot of things. So Arpita, what what do you say about gatekeeping in publishing? And how is it evolved? Hello. Uh I think um Gatekeeping happens in a big way, uh, continues to happen in a big way. There are, that's no secret. Uh, for me, what's, um, what's worrying is that the gatekeeping is often done by um, people we don't expect gatekeeping from. And I think that is something we need to think about a little more as well. Um, I think there are many, many, um, you know, uh, publishing women, um, privileged publishing women, and unfortunately, a fair amount of gatekeeping has been done by them as well. And uh, I'm always, you know, disliked for saying this, uh, but I have to say it because that's my truth. Um, the fact is that in the feminist movement, at least in India, when I'm talking, I mean, because my authors are generally either younger or they are uh, queer people, um, I mean, uh, you know, or they are trans people, trans women. And the fact of the matter is that there has been a legacy of gatekeeping by upper caste, upper class um, women in literature and in publishing in India. And, um, you know, uh, they haven't done uh, women who did not have that power. They haven't done them any favors by letting them have the space. Uh, millennial women, Dalit women, queer women, young Muslim women, uh, trans women have wrested that space and have made their voices heard. Um, in, I would say, the last 10 to 15 years when the authorship in India has shown a tremendous kind of diversity. Um, I don't think, you know, anybody's done anyone favors. And I think this is something we have to remember because I have a marvelous uh, lesbian author called Maya Sharma, who's just written her second book on, um, uh, you know, queer history in Gujarat for us and her first woman loving women women in uh, loving women um, being lesbian and unprivileged india came out in 2007 and she says it very openly in her introduction how um, in the 90, 80s and 90s women's movement you know they were told not to speak about their sexuality and they were told not to talk about the fact that they were um, queer women and how that would uh, problematize, it was said to them, that would problematize the existence of the movement. And I think 
you know, whatever uh, Maya uh, and, and, and absolutely fantastic authors like Maya have managed to do within the queer community, they have done it by pushing back against this kind of, um, uh, this kind of in invisibilization and, 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 you know, other women, more powerful women speaking for them. Uh, similarly, I published uh, another wonderful scholar called Ghazala Jamil, who teaches in JNU here. Uh, the book is called Muslim Women Speak. And in the introduction, she talks very, very openly about the fact that, um, you know, uh, when it came to talking about um, uh, uh, Muslim women side by side with Muslim men, when Muslim women pose that question that, uh, you know, we need to also, we, we have to talk about our truth, which also includes what is happening to Muslim men currently in South Asia. Um, uh, she was shut down at a seminar by being told that you are, you know, this is not, you're not being, in other words, being disloyal to the system. And uh, these are the ways in which gatekeeping has happened from within the ranks. You know, and I, I think there's just, of course, there is the big enemy of, uh, you know, very uh, easily visible enemy of the uh, privileged ma uh, male, this is head privileged male. But I think we have to also address and speak more openly about the accountability and responsibility we need to show within our ranks. I think that's when there is a way forward. No doubt about it. We need to uh, look within uh, to find uh, the gatekeeping uh, and find the myths uh, we have been uh, pestered with. Uh, Namrata, would you like to uh, say something about uh, gatekeeping? Sure. Uh, taking it forward from what Arpita shared, uh, apart from this type of gatekeeping where, you know, we, we, we are not offering enough opportunities to women, to queer people, to trans people, there is also another kind of gatekeeping that I have seen is where, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, watered down versions of their stories, which they want to consider when they are publishing, especially when it comes to traditional publishing. Like, you know, I have an experience, I have a view, it may or may not be, you know, something that everybody wants to know, but that's the truth. It might be uncomfortable, it might be ugly, or, you know, it might make people uncomfortable, but that's the truth. But I have seen that there were many authors whom I know in person who have then opted for, you know, self-publishing or just gone and published the book on Kindle because they were not comfortable with those those versions, those watered down versions of their realities being altered. Even this is a type of gatekeeping, which I feel we should not be doing. When we are giving them a platform, like Arpita rightly said, we are not doing anybody a favor. Nobody is doing anybody any favors. When you're giving a platform, let their voice be heard. As they want to say, as they want to talk, what is their story, let it come forward. You know, if, if you try to water it down, you're trying to alter that version and then it doesn't make sense giving them that stage. Yes, not only gatekeeping, but uh, also uh, editing to the point that what people want to hear and uh, not the real version and not the truth. Uh, Christina. Thanks so much for the question. I think that's an excellent question and uh, what a pleasure listening to all of you. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, emphasize on a couple of things that has already been said, perhaps, and just one other point that I wanted to make, uh, emphatically agreeing with what Arpita mentioned about how there needs to be accountability, even amongst those of us who are passionate about inclusion. Um, and, and I think that points to responsible, self-accounted leadership, right? The leadership that is, that you're able to have self accountability for and also collective accountability. And I I can give an example as to what happened with my book. Uh, so when I had first submitted uh, my proposal, which was again in, um, in response to a request that came from uh, a specific editor, um, they said that, you know, we don't want uh, another Dalit woman's story in this format who's coming from an urban uh, setting because uh, there's already one 
out there. So in a way, what they want out of marginalized communities is that you can have only one type of story from this community. And that was quite discouraging for me because I am a I'm I'm probably the first writer in in my in my family, so to say, and that was, I mean, if I had taken that to heart, then I would not be sitting with a contract right now. But then, what really happened, and, and this is an example of of someone who who demonstrated responsible leadership, is the is the editor that I have right now. Again, this was uh, they came to me uh, because they had read and read a piece of mine, and they had said, you know, we want to publish you, and and tell us what you what you can write for us. And when I submitted this proposal, and I also kind of was very hesitant, and I told them, you know, uh, this is the kind of feedback I received from another editor. What is your opinion? And they were like. You know, we have nothing to say about that. I mean, this is your story and this is your experience. And we are very happy to go with you on that journey. And we are very happy to publish you because we have confidence that your writing is going to change the way people think. And that, that to me made such a huge difference. So encouraging, so life affirming that it got me to the point where I'm where I'm into my book, writing my book, being encouraged every moment uh, because I, I have that confidence both from my editor as well as the people who are around me telling me that your writing is powerful and that your writing is important. Um, the second kind of um, gatekeeping that I feel uh, that sort of happens is uh, who is speaking for who, right? And, and this is especially true of marginalized communities. Again, this probably relates to the representation that we spoke of, because when it comes to Dalit women and Dalit queer people, there's also this question as to who is writing about us, right? To, to give you an example, um, this thing about Dalit culture and Dalit food, right? A lot has been written um, and so, as a, as a writer who wants to sort of write about their lived experiences of Dalit culture and Dalit food specifically, just giving examples, I will have to do a lot of undoing of this content that has already been put out there by people who don't have that lived experience and then produce content that is authentic and that is based on lived experience. Now, this sort of gatekeeping has already happened before we are even part of this arena, before we are even having a chance to fight, before we are having a chance to compete. Um, and so I think, again, it points to responsible leadership. Like how do you foresee these things? How do you do the homework to see that, hey, there exists content that needs to be undone. And how do you, uh, how do you respond to authors and proposals, um, who are coming to you with great content, but are not necessarily the right people to tell those stories because they're, those stories are not theirs to say or talk about. So I think those are things that we need to keep in mind uh, when it comes to looking at gatekeeping uh, generally. Yeah. I think, Christina, that's an excellent point you've raised. I, again, relate to it on so many levels. And since we've been talking about disruption, Meher, in particular, you've been mentioning how your work has created an impact and how you wanted it to do so. There's another disruption that has happened in the publishing industry, and that's the advent of technology and you know how the digital revolution is kind of opening up the space for marginalized writers, publishers, women of color. So uh, like your comment on that, whether that's you know, giving space, but then also, you know, in that process with a lot of open access material that we see that is bringing a lot of recognition to the writers, but at the same time, you know, how do you make it sustainable? How do you, uh, you know, how do you make sure because paywalls have their own challenges. There are so many other issues with how the digital revolution has its own limitations. So how do you kind of create that balance and what's uh, you know, your take on the digital revolution? Meher, we'll start with you. You know, Nida, as much as I love the digital revolution and listening to everyone here, I was just struck by something that I wish what I had to say was at par or was along the same lines of what everyone else here is saying. But in Pakistan, there's so much um, 
It's a society and the state that limits our, how we express ourselves. And even though the digital realm is definitely something that I feel we will have to explore because of um, the economic crisis that the country is going through, simple things such as ink, paper, electricity are all so, so precious that publishers are going to have to change their models of printing. Uh, I've been talking about sustainability since 2018. And finally, we've come to a point where last summer, I believe, or yes, it was last summer, when all the printers turned around and they said, we're not publishing books anymore. Of course, there were political reasons for that as well. But I, I was just struck by the fact that here we are in a country and printers are not printing books. Where, what are we supposed to do? So the natural step, the, the, the most logical thing is to get onto the digital realm, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, um, you know, setting up blogs, websites. But then is there any freedom for, for people, for marginalized communities? No, there isn't. Just a member of the Shia community has to say something on Twitter and all of Twitter explodes. I'm not even going to mention what happens when somebody from the Ahmadi community, and let's not even get into the queer community at all right i mean one of the things that I, I i constantly struggle with is how do we get these narratives out to the world because as i said before the world doesn't want to hear from pakistan they're not interested in pakistani writers so it's a duty upon us to get the written word out somehow now how do we do that given that geography goes against us as well right so this is something that i grapple with and i did try to I explored different versions of doing it as well. I tried partnering with um, a publishing platform, which is run by and supports queer people in Pakistan. Um, I tried setting up a podcast. There were all these different things, but th there's so much fear. How do you overcome that fear? And out of all the emotions in the human life, I, I hate this, this, this emotion the most because it is so crippling. It prevents you from doing something that you, you, you can possibly do, but you'll never really get to it. That's why I insist on publishing work that has an impact, that opens up space. For example, um, this is going to sound incredible and, and completely unbelievable, but I published Pakistan's first graphic novel two years ago. That's shocking that even something as simple as a graphic novel is not accepted in our society. And it was a difficult book to sell because people just weren't aware of it. They were like, is this a comic book? If it's a comic book, why is it like Archie? It's not, a, it's not an Archie comic book. It's, it's a nonfiction graphic novel. So when you have these concepts, then all the more reason for us to do book, books that push out the narrative, that create space, and once you create that space, you have to sort of ensure that there is safety and security. So that means that publishing immediately becomes political. And when it becomes political, then you're looking at legal matters, then you're looking at political parties, you're looking at legislation, you're looking at other elements of it as well, which also means that the fight for digital space continues. You're in it, I'm in it, I'm sure Nazit is in it. So I, I, this is why I often say that this is also why we need to partner with international organizations. Like if we're not able to publish their work here, at least they can have a voice outside. And Pakistanis have done that. Those Pakistanis who are living abroad, they've been able to write their own lived experiences as minorities, religious minorities, persecuted minorities, um, sexual minorities. They've been able to do it. It's not that it isn't possible. It's just a means of finding a way of getting their narratives out there. And that can only be done if we have partnerships, particularly in South Asia, which is also why I lament the book's ban because India was the only outlet that we had. Now that that's gone, what do we do? We can all try in some way or the other using the digital realm, but it comes at such a high risk that there's only so much that one can do. I know the risks I've had to take for each and every single one of my authors, including my own book. And what I, I know them. I, I've lived through them, I've experienced them, but it's also imperative for me to keep going. And hopefully somebody will hear us and then and be like, okay, let's do this. Let's partner and see where we can go from here. Thank that's, you, that's what Pakistan yeah. is at.
in interest of time, I'm just going to take this question quickly to Arpita and sort of take her view on this since, you know, in, it, it relates to publishing. Uh, so digital publishing and fair compensation and how do you kind of avoid exploitation uh, because open access and, and the limitations of uh, digital revolution. So quick comment from you. Then I'm going to hand it over to Nuzit for her questions for Namrita and Christina. Yes, sir. Nida, um, I have to say, you know, from the point of view of book publishing, um, which is what I am, I, I don't do, I mean, the paywall and other things come into play more when you're talking about uh, news publishing, uh, features publishing, publishing on stories on digital platforms. Um, I know that now there's a lot of overlap between the two, but I'm still in that sense, I still fall in that part of the community, which is essentially a mainstream traditional book publisher. Um, so where I am positioned, the fact that, you know, we are in the uh, very much in the digital era has only been a good thing. And I feel that um, not just in terms of people getting, uh, you know, uh, uh, voices that were earlier completely out of the pale, finding uh, their niches, their spaces, um, and, and their followings. Uh, and here I'm obviously talking about social media. Um, I'm also talking about how for smaller independent publishers like myself, social media has allowed us to access our readerships um, in a way that mainstream publishers do via you know, these platforms like Twitter, like Instagram, and to drive sales via these platforms in a way that mainstream publishers do. Uh, we don't have to sit and worry about, you know, uh, bookstore after bookstore telling us, uh, oh, you know, we don't have the space. We have to make every real estate. Books are real estate for us. You have to make it count. Only Penguin books can uh, go on up my shelves. You know, the fact is we can sell too. I mean, it's all very good to hate Amazon and other online publishing platforms. And I understand why. And we have a network of friendly brick and mortar bookstores through India that we are constantly promoting and cross marketing with over Instagram. But the fact of the matter is, whenever there's online selling happening of our print books, the money is in the bank the next day. You know, and whereas the minute, it, you know, we are getting into our distribution system and via that into the retail system, distribution system is a black hole in India, some of you know, because we give away 60% sometimes of our, uh, 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 you know, the cover price to them and as discounts. And then we don't... This is this is stuff that I can now relate to. This part of the yeah. conversation I can relate and, and to. And we don't get paid. I mean, the, we have to give don't them get a pay. We have to get a give them a credit period at times of 180 days. You know, so what what does one subsist on, and how does one pay salaries in the meantime? So the digital revolution for me has mitigated a lot of this misery, you know, to a large extent. And the last part I'll um, uh, mention is, for instance, I'll give an example. We published this book. Um, by the Pakistani author. It's an edited volume by a Pakistani author, Seher Mirza, which is a collection of short stories by Indian writers and Pakistani writers. And we brought it out during um, the 75th um, uh, uh, anniversary of the independences and, the part and partition. And um, because of the digital revolution, we could send the file across to a friendly publisher in Pakistan, and we could print the South Asia edition in India, and they could print the Pakistani edition uh, in uh, Pakistan, because Indian books will not go there, Pakistani books will not come here, I mean, in terms of stocks, right? So, uh, you know, in the internet made it possible. So I feel that at the moment, at least from the books publishing space, I think it's a good thing. Of course, what you're talking about, paywalls and other things, I mean, perhaps others can, who are writers and who are dealing with writing for platforms and then finding that their writing is getting blocked from wider readership by paywalls, they can speak to that because that is definitely a problem. Yes. 
Um, my question is for Namrata and Christina. So we do not have enough opportunities for editors and writers. So uh, tell us some ways, how can we create an inclusive environment within the publishing landscape to uh, support our editor, editorial teams and the writers? Uh, Namrata, do sure. you want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, Nusrat, uh, apart from the opportunities, I also feel that there is a certain lack of transparency when it comes to publishing in India. And uh, that is what makes it a little more inaccessible or at least seemingly more inaccessible for people. Say, for example, today, uh, if somebody is studying in the 12th standard and they know that they want to study computers, they know that, you know, teen sal graduation ke baad, this is the package that I can look for. This is the industry. This is the jobs that I can start for. We don't have a transparency even in the salaries structures of publishing houses which are there there is no transparency even in the royalties that are offered to authors so i think the first and the most important step that we should be taking in india is to be open you know have an open conversation put the numbers let everybody know we all say that writing is not an affordable career to have but why you know we, we need to give that out like let's put that out let people know that if you are investing in say an mfa coming out with a book what do you expect if you are studying for an editorial course what can you expect how does how much does it take you know for a person with say less than one year and experience this is the bracket of income that you can expect and and the second problem also that i feel is uh, we need to be a little more inclusive when it comes to uh, you know editing jobs or even you know, lit fests or all that, where I say that we need to, uh, I have raised this uh, in a different way. So I'm trying to phrase it here is, I feel that we all should be open to working with uh, teams across the country. We did that when the pandemic happened. You know, when a publisher says that, no, you need to relocate to Delhi for this job, even if it's a, if it's a dream job, but we, we, don't, we don't know the salaries, we don't know things. It doesn't make sense for somebody to do that. So I feel that it needs to be inclusive, it needs to be transparent, and most importantly, it needs to be accessible for everyone. And some of the things that we should do is we should have a lot of uh, workshops, a lot of trainings that we could offer, a lot of mentorship programs where we take up. And instead of have not having the numbers, we do have mentorships, but we don't have the numbers, the salaries, the pays, and everything. We should also talk about that apart from that. Uh, yes, uh, no doubt about it. Transparency is very important and uh, uh, we do not have that in Pakistan too. We can relate to this. Uh, we need transparency here about publishing. Uh, Christina? Hi, thanks so much for that question. Um, so I think I, I just had like a couple of points. I know we are running out of time. Um, one is that I think the, the sense that I get is that um, Publish, the publishing industry is still a very close-knit circle, right? I mean, despite all of our efforts and our uh, intention to keep it diverse and inclusive, it is still sort of a close-knit industry, at least from, from, uh, from what I see in the position that I'm in. Um, so I think whether it's formal or informal networks, I think that can be a great game changer, for particularly for writers from marginalized communities being able to connect them with editors, uh, being able to connect them with opportunities. I think that can, that can be so disruptive for them, especially people uh, uh, who are coming from the Dalit community in India, as well as in the South Asian, uh, South Asia, uh, as, as the Dalit I think we in a place where we are, where there's a perfect, Uh, part of that responsible leadership that I keep talking about, be able to spot that paradigm shift and to and to you know get that get that uh, connections going. And as people with power and position and networks and that we can do, not just for our own communities and our own circles, but also for people who are who we know are marginalized and who we know are uh, not having access to opportunities. The second thing that I wanted to mention, and I'll try to keep this quick, is um, I, I think as, as publishers, 
uh, and this is more of more of a request as a, as a writer is that i think actively looking out for uh, authors definitely helps and and one of the uh, problems that we face uh, so my contact is in india and so my publication will have publishing will happen in india of my book but when i'm trying to publish it in the global north you're still running into problems because publishers here are are looking at this work as too academic or too neat and therefore you know I'm, and i'm always wondering uh, should i just keep it very india even be thinking of publishing it in the uk or the us so that's a very specific problem that some of us in the diaspora face and um, it is also a problem when you're trying to internationalize issues like caste is an issue that you want the entire world to be talking about and publishing books on caste will make a big difference will make a huge sort of um a disruption in this in this sort of in in the in the caste conversation so i think being able to uh understand this nuance and actively looking out for writers actively like 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 how my editor did i think that would also really help in terms of working towards true inclusion and true diversity thank you so much with that we've come to an end to this conversation already i cannot believe how and where time went by but thank you so much we've uh, learned about what inclusion and inclusive publishing really means in terms of not just the diversity of writers but also the diversity in the content and letting their voices be heard without being edited or gate kept we've talked about the digital revolution we've talked about we haven't talked about the wider readership and how how inclusive readership is also an aspect of inclusive publishing but maybe some other time sabeen over to you and thank you for the opportunity and thanks to all the um, uh, pa panelists and to nuzrat my co moderator for this wonderful conversation so been over to you thank you so much thank you so much thank you everyone for this uh, wonderful conversation